<laughs> this is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value, and a new experience. Welcome to the Geese Spot Podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love sound bites. Join us for conversations around sex, spirit, and all things self-care. All things self-care. All things self-care. This is a journey into You are a G-Spot podcast with Katie Silcox. As you know, this podcast is sponsored by Ahara Ghee, one of my favorite Ayurveda products. But did you know that over at Ahara, you can also buy something called Maha Ghee? It's made at the Green Ashram in Gujarat, and it's from Indian Gear Humpback Cows. Now, this is for the real Ayurvedic purists, because guys, what this means is they are beautiful hand-milked humpback cow. It's probably one of the only places you're going to be able to get this. So head over there. Also, with the amazing knowledge that their ghee is tested for Roundup and really beyond organic. This is so important. What I love also about this company is that they are the first in the world to be animal welfare certified by a greener world. This helps support transparency in agriculture and environmentally sustainable farming practices. So... I know you don't need any more convincing, but lastly, it's the best ghee in the world. It's the one I use, and you should head over there now for Ahara Ghee. We'll give you all the link in the show notes. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am so stoked. I have one of my favorite humans on the planet with us today. That is not an over-exaggeration. She's an amazing yogini. She's been studying yoga and tantra since 1995. She has a book coming out March 9th, which we are going to give you a link to called Radiant Rest, Yoga Nidra for Deep Relaxation and Awakened Clarity. Tracy Stanley is a faculty member at Esalen Institute, Omega and Kripalu. She's a contributor with Woke Magazine. She's the founder of the Sankalpa Shakti Yoga School and the co-founder of Empowered Wisdom Yoga Nidra Training School. She's also so much more than that. She is a a real um, place that I go to when I need a reflection that I feel holds the deep breadth of human experience. This woman really is able to walk on all these different layers of who we are. And I just feel like that's such a rarity in the world. And so Tracy, welcome to the Geese Spot. We're so happy you're here. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. It's so um, amazing to be with you. Yeah. So, um, you know, Tracy and I will sometimes get on the phone and just forget that time exists. And I want to, there, Tracy and I could talk about everything Tantra. We uh, both have studied very similar, although different things, very in a very similar lineage. But today we're actually going to focus on what you have coming up, which is your amazing book on yoga nidra. And as I said to you before, when we were chatting, I am so excited because a, this book is coming out and I actually gave Tracy a little nudge back in the day. Like you need to write a book on yoga nidra because I think she offers a different way of entering into relationship with it. So for my first question for you is for our listeners, give me your definition of what yoga nidra is and maybe a little bit of the background around it. Mm, thank you for that. Well, the, the word that I want to pull through that you just mentioned was relationship. Mm. And I feel like what I am offering is a way to be in relationship with yoga nidra. And a lot of times we think about yoga nidra and we think about it as a technique right? That's how it was introduced to me when I first learned anything about yoga nidra. Oh, it's a technique, but it's also a state of consciousness. And it's a state of consciousness that is very similar to the state of samadhi, right? And scholars could probably talk about the nine different levels of samadhi and which one yoga nidra fits into. Um, And it's also this fourth state. 
So we have waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and Turiya, which is known as the fourth. And it is really this place of no thought and non-doing. And that's the place that we get to travel to at the deepest, deepest level of our practice when we really let go and allow prana to just bring us back to source. And then of course we have yoga nidra as a goddess. And, you know, I remember when I first learned that there was a goddess yoga nidra, it was a teaching that I received from Sri Devi Bringi. Um, and I had been chanting the names of the goddess for a long time. I had been chanting the Devi Suktam. And I remember hearing that Ya Devi Sarvabhuteshu Nidra Rupena Samsita and thinking, oh, it's Nidra like sleep or it's Nidra like the technique. And she was like, no, no, this is Nidra the goddess. This is the manifestation of the divine mother as the power of sleep. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, hold on a second. Why didn't I ever know about this before? And so what I think is really beautiful is when we can have a relationship with all three of those manifestations of what we call yoga nidra, mm. the practice, the state of consciousness, as in being aware that that is what's available to us through mm. this practice, and the goddess who is there to hold us unconditionally. You know, as you're speaking, I'm feeling her coming into my body. And it seems to me like you and I spoke before of the way in which we are all being invited into this big unraveling of the overlays of, for example, patriarchal culture and colonialism and decolonizing the body. And I think there can be a reaction to that, but there's a misunderstanding because what yoga nidra essentially is what I hear you saying is that this goddess, AKA a superpower, a gift within us and around us is the gift of rest. And all of us were brought up in this Western culture where, I mean, I'm bringing tears to my eyes. It's like, never stop always sympathetic, go, go, go. And here you are saying, actually one of our superpowers and gifts from the goddess is the ability to, to take it easy and, and, and rest. And in my own nervous system, this has been such an arduous journey to actually give myself permission. One of my teachers says, find the part of you that's already resting. And can you go there? Mm -hmm. So um, the role of surrender in this, um, I mean, well, let's just assume that maybe people don't know what yoga nidra is. I mean, we, we you and I kind of went to this sort of beautiful esoteric realm, but like, what is yoga nidra? So folks who are listening are like, what is this? I want to do it. Yeah, So, so yoga nidra is... Um, often translated as the yoga of sleep, right? And, and we can say that it's sleep with a slight trace of awareness. Mm -hmm. So it's conscious sleep. It's being conscious of that place within you that is always resting yet awake, mm -hmm. right? And so we get to remain awake and aware to the transitions, the transitions between the states of consciousness, the transitions between the thoughts, the transitions between the inhales and the exhales. And that's really the practice. So the practice is generally done lying down in some sort of a supported position. So most of the time it's taught in Shavasana, but it can be done side lying if you're pregnant. It can be done propped up in, uh, in a kind of reclined position. So it's really just asking you to allow yourself to be so supported and so comfortable and so supremely at ease that you feel safe to be able to release and let go. Mm. And we can also talk about the safety aspect in a minute yeah, because that that's not everyone is going to feel where, safe. That's yeah. where my brain lit up. Yeah. The role and of safety in a, in, in a reality that isn't safe. <laughs> One hundred percent, one hundred percent, and so, 
it is, um, you know, that's something that I talk about in my book is that for many of us, especially um, people in marginalized communities and black and brown bodies, it, it hasn't been safe for us to close our eyes or to feel like we can rest, right? Mm. So we're, we're really receiving um, the medicine of this practice of yoga nidra is really needed for anyone who doesn't feel as though it's safe for them to let go. Totally. Right. Well, that fills me up with so much joy to know that we have this resource for, like you said, it's so important for people of color, but also anyone, you know, I think of my own experience too, where it's like, if you've grown up in abuse mm-hmm. or um, any type of abuse, right. Societal, cultural, familial of origin, there are many of us on the planet that just don't feel like we can close our eyes. Like that's such even even, like, like I was listening to your podcast with Jeff Krasno and you brought up anxiety and insomnia. Like it is this um, deep feeling that it's not safe to let go. Yeah. Most of us have that. Most of us have that to some degree. Yeah. And, you know, yoga nidra, if you become, interested in a relationship with it, it really allows you to start to peel away what's underneath that, Mm. right? Um, And at the same time, you don't have to close your eyes to practice yoga nidra. Mm. You don't have to close your eyes. You and I could sit here right now and we could go through the points in the body and we could just bring our awareness there. And we can still come into this place of moving into parasympathetic nervous system response. That's essentially what it is, you know, and what I love about yoga nidra, especially when done within this, what I would call feminine form context of the Devi, the divine mother and the holding is that this systematic moving through points can be, if taught well, super embodying for folks who may, for whatever reason, have made a decision, usually unconscious, to disembody. And so I think that that using is a way of like on a shamanic level, a soul retrieval to the viscera is my experience of what yoga nidra can be. It can also be taught in a way that's very disembodying, but as with any meditation, Um, one of the things that I heard you speaking about, and I'm sure you talk about in your forthcoming book is this light of the heart, this Jyotish, um, and the way that yoga Nidra has the capacity to introduce us to the different koshas or layers of who we are. And so I'd love for you to speak about identity, the layers, and then what it is about this practice that really brings us into this place that we all share that is beyond all this layers. And without, (laughs) you know, I'm deep. That's a deep one. Yes. I mean, I feel like at, first of all, we, we want, I want to say two things. The first thing is, is that we have to realize that yoga nidra is a laya yoga practice. It is a practice of dissolution, Mm. right? It's also the ultimate practice of pratyahara. Mm. And so when we think about pratyahara, a lot of times we think about, oh, pratyahara, it's the one of the limbs of yoga. It's the withdrawal of the senses. And it is the withdrawal of the senses, but it's also the withdrawal of the senses so that we can expand into our origin. So that we can reassimilate into our true nature. And as we move through that experience, we become more sensitized to prana, Mm -hmm. right? And we become more aware of prana. And I remember the first time that I was leading myself through um, a practice of Shatali Karana. And at some point in the practice, I was like, wait a second, I can feel my pranamaya kosha. I can feel the energy and that was like the click of, okay, we we're taking a journey right now through the koshas and this practice is allowing me to become more aware that I 
no, intellectually, I have a subtle body, mm. right? Because I've learned all about, not all about, but I've learned about the koshas. And now I'm actually getting to put the, that information together and realize that, oh, I'm actually, fe- I'm actually able to feel this space. Mm. I'm actually able to feel the space of thought. And so that was an interesting realization because how I was um, learning about the practices of deep relaxation were not tied to the koshas. So Tracy, just for folks that don't know, koshas are, there are essentially five in our tradition, our physical body, our thinking body, our energy body, the body of the intuition, and then this sort of astral causal bliss body. And when we, you and I are like super familiar with that language, but Mm -hmm. I find it so liberating for folks because the, the aspects of our identity are essentially woven through these bodies. And through this practice, we begin to quote, purify this and recognize that there's this thing that we are, that's not of these bodies. And yet, you know, it's not that we don't have these bodies forever, but like, just for folks that are like, what are these koshas? Yeah, yeah. I think it's also good to just give the the definition um, that's widely used as the kosha as a layer or a sheath, right? And so when I'm teaching, I like to use the Russian nesting dolls and to talk about exactly what you mentioned earlier, this light, right? That if we think about this um, <clears throat> sutra 136, the shokama joytishmati is like this, there's this light that is inside of us that is eternal. Mm. It was there before you had a name. It will be there when you no longer have a body. Mm. And these koshas are covering that light of the soul. And our practice allows us to transcend the koshas so that we can taste that light and have a remembrance of what and who we really are. And yet fully embody all the koshas. And what I love about the definition of my favorite definition of pranayama is it's not nostril torture, but actually that the veils that block the light are removed. And as you work with your energy body, the veils that block that light are removed. But in fact, as you access that light, your body becomes more healthy and beautiful. Your personality becomes more authentic. Your work for activism and love in the world becomes more informed by what I call God. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that you transcend in this like spiritual bypassy way, but you actually emerge as her into the world. Yeah. You have to go through. There's no going around. (laughs) <laughs> like, there's no going around. I mean, sorry it's like, guys. <laughs> it's nice to say, oh, I want to meditate on the heart center and see this beautiful light. But then you also have to see the other things that come up, the other things that come up that are actually not you, mm. right? And things that memories and things that have happened in the past. Mm. And you have to really face face who you are. And I feel like Yoga Nidra really asks us to surrender to the point where we can let go of breathing from our personality Mm. and that we can remember that part of us that was there when the universe was created. Mm. Powerful stuff. It, It takes me to the place of Ishvara Pranidhana, this surrender to the divine. And in this tumultuous time that we're living in, you know, I often ask God, like, why are you doing this to me? Like, why is it so hard? And the answer, Bindu Visarga, like it drops down into me. I'm teaching you, you know, and I feel like all of us are in this great university moment where we're getting our asses handed to us a little bit by God (laughs) with like the pandemic and George Floyd and white supremacy, like all these things that the collective is saying, look at my pain, don't walk away from it. And yet I feel like the missing medicine in the world today is this light, right? And so how do we hold both? And what I think you're saying Yoga Nidra does is it invites us into the greatest surrender of all, which is the fact that there is a great void. (laughs) Like 
you know, we don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. And yet what I've experienced through many practices, one of them being yoga nidra is like, when you actually do surrender into that light or into that void, and it's terrifying, you find that there's something actually holding you and you're free. You're free from, for a moment, right? You're free from your gender orientation, your sexual, you're, you're free from the labels, you're free from it. And then you can kind of go forth and do good in the world. And so maybe you can speak to this juxtaposition of surrender and fierce warriorship and getting shit done and like taking a stand and like all the things that we have to do. Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, a great point because when we think about the surrender, the surrender is also a dismantling, Mm. right? It really requires you, like I said earlier, to look deep within. That means that you need to look at your own belief systems and you need to start dismantling so you can get to the truth of who you really are. And if you're not able to do that, I believe that it will be really difficult for you to do that out in the world. Absolutely. So the work has to happen here first within. And from that place of understanding also um, that we are always supported. Mm. We are always supported. The goddess is there, whether you want to feel that it's the goddess in the form of the earth, your ancestors are there. There are benevolent beings and there are guides and there are the lineage holders from your traditions that are there holding and supporting you. And you have to ask them to come in. And you have to ask them to come in. And so it is, um, I think it's through that practice of really touching into your true nature, dismantling everything that is not true. Mm. That allows you to have clarity Mm. so that when you go out into the world, you understand what it is that is yours to do and you understand how to do it and you have the courage to be able to go and do it. Yeah. And everybody has a different Dharma, right? And like, that's what I'm sharing with my students now in Shakti school, we're going into Tarpaka Kapha, which is the white matter of your brain. It's your um, sexual fluids, your connective tissue. It's your cerebrospinal fluids. Mm -hmm. And this fluid actually holds the ancestral memory. Mm -hmm. And so that's just been so powerful to talk about why we're doing twists, why we're doing abhyanga, where we rub our bodies, why maybe, you know, sexual relationships are so intense. It's like we're interfacing with our ancestry that we hold as unconscious memory. And so when you do something like yoga nidra, you're doing that dismantling on the subtle level, but also, I don't know if there's a word, Tracy, but maybe we could invent it up, which is a remantling. And so it's not that we like, I think about parts work and psychotherapy where you, you see all your different ages, like, oh, there's the chubby 13 year old that doesn't think she's pretty. And you know what I mean? And like, I have, because I'm a student of Laya yoga, there's like, okay, dismantle her. Whereas the goddess is more like, yes, in the sense of not identifying with her and not letting the 10 year old or the 13 year old or the cultural overlay, et cetera, run the show. But how do we integrate? Like, how do we get that dissolving to happen in such a way that's not um, like, you know what I'm trying to say, Tracy? Like, yeah, I, I don't yeah. want to demonize, it's, you know? It's, it's basically the, the pratyahara, pratyahara as the reassimilation. Yes. You have to let go. You have to see, right? So we're not bypassing. We have to see, we have to acknowledge, we have to do the work. And this is one of the reasons why for me, when I teach yoga nidra or any practice, even if it's yoga asana and meditation, it is accompanied with self-inquiry. Yeah. It is accompanied with svadhyaya because the wisdom that comes back from the practice, the clarity, the silence, we need to be able to activate our smirti so that we remember 
Mm. And then we can go do because, you know, the way that we're, we've been taught yoga a lot of times is like, oh, we're going to do these practices and then we're going to run off and get into the car. We're going to run off and go to Instagram or to the next thing. And it's like, no, but this is the place where the reassimilation gets to happen. Mm. Yes. I love that. The nourishment. Yeah. So that, that to me is really important, which is why I have self-inquiry in the book Radiant Rest that's coming out because I want people to be able to do the practices and Mm. then receive the wisdom that's waiting for them. So they can make those life changes. They can see where the thoughts are coming from and where the beliefs are coming from and how the patterns repeat themselves over and over and over again, even through generations. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's all I think it is, is a reassimilation to our true, true nature. One of the things that we're learning in Ayurveda school, which by the way, Tracy's one of our beloved teachers is Dr. Ladd speaks about it in his book or textbook of we think our cravings are ours. We think our addictions are ours. We think the people we're sexually attracted to are ours, but actually it's our ancestors, <laughs> you know? And so as we do this work, you know, it can feel like a great burden, um, especially for some of us more than others. Like, I can't believe I have to take on this burden, but what Tantra teaches us is that you are actually equal to the task. And it's an honor to do the work of dismantling and remantling our our lineage karma through things like yoga nidra, because as Dr. Ladd reminds us, and you are saying the same thing, Tracy, presence and love and awareness purify the karmas like that. And when the mango is ripe, it gets juiced. And in the emotional body, that actually looks like sometimes like feeling things and having a good cry or, or sensing the rage of your ancestors and like having the digestive enzymes to be able to digest it comes from silence, Mm -hmm. right? Knowing that light, knowing who you really are. I want to make sure we get this in. One of the definitions you, you give of Nidra is to bring forth. And I'd never heard that Tracy. And, um, I want to speak to what your vision is on the role of this radiant rest and this goddess of Nidra and creating the life that you want. And you know, you and I are both big fans of tantric art and science of manifestation and co-creation with God. And so like, what's the role of rest in that? Mm. Well, first I want to um, cite a source that I didn't know it came from until, until later. Um, that this, this etymology of the word nidra is ni from void and drew from to draw forth. And I had received that from a teacher. And then later I, I learned that it came from Indu Aurora. Ah, um, we love it. Person who I absolutely love. Um, and so to draw forth from the void, you know, that void, which is both fertile and empty. Yeah. And that's part of the wisdom that comes back with you. And the, the rest is really a byproduct of what happens when you welcome sure. yourself back from yoga nidra. Mm-hmm. So the, it's, the radiant rest is really like, this is me returning back to that place within me that is the light beyond all sorrow. Mm-hmm. Me touching into that. And I get to come back rested. Oh. Okay. I just have to say this. I'm getting tears because, you know, the way I was taught yoga nidra, let me, let me say it this way. When someone has a lot of trauma, particularly freeze, mm-hmm. freeze, it's like in Ayurveda and you, you say this as well, Tracy, like the individuality of the student is super important. And that's why we need a teacher, right? Cause like that person can hopefully help us in a way that might be different for someone else. And when a student has a lot of freeze in their system, yoga nidra, especially if not taught in the way you're 
teaching it can be really scary and reintroduce deeper freeze, right? And so I just want you to know that the way that you're sharing it, this goddess, this divine mother, where you're actually being offered a resting place. For me, what I'm feeling is that I'm being invited back into the practice of yoga nidra, because for me in my system, because I had so much freeze to actually like fight and run a little bit was like really liberating for my Kundalini, right. To, to dance and to move and to like emote was like super awakening. And now I feel like you're initiating me back into yoga nidra. And I feel so excited to be able to come back to it from a place of a different way of approaching it. And I think just that understanding of the gift, the byproduct of being held in light, if that's not the major influence, it can feel like a way, like, you know, that someone who already, and I say this with meditation in general, folks that are tend to be drawn to yoga and meditation are often folks that are really good at disembodying already. And so how do we make sure that we're creating that place where the emotional body can be honored, the the physical need to fight and move and push and pull, excuse me, can be honored so that we could even get to a place where we feel safe enough to to rest. Do you you know Mm -hmm. what I mean, Tracy? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that goes with, um, for me, a lot of times, at least when the first um, few years of learning the practice, it was basically said that you have to be perfectly still. Yeah. Right. Dead and, still. <laughs> yeah. Cor- and cor- so that, that can, that in itself, it can be extremely traumatizing to hear that you have to remain perfectly still because in a traumatic situation, you may have been told that exactly to be quiet and to be still. Exactly. And so I really encourage, and and when I'm teaching, I'm really encouraging people to move and adjust and to turn on their side and to do whatever they need to do for them to feel comfortable, as well as we we create these circles of protection around us. We we draw a, a circle of protection with the ancestors and benevolent beings and guides, and we draw another circle of healing that has all of our plants and our healing tools. And then we draw another circle of wisdom that just holds all of our elders. And, and that, and has been, we'll say that again. In, in my, in, in my studies over the past year, we call that the matrix of support. And, and that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's a place of support. It's a place of, and, and during this pandemic, it's really interesting that that has been the one practice um, that people have really, because I also use that in my meditation teacher, you know, when I'm teaching meditation, because we, we need to feel this support. We need to feel this protection. We need to know that we're protected. And at the same time, there are other teachers like Richard Miller, who, who teaches IREST, who has done so much work and so much research on PTSD and veterans and trauma and, and working with the pairs of opposites um, in this world of, um, you know, teaching on Zoom, I don't really work with the pairs of opposites because it's something that I really want to be able to be with somebody one-on-one. Totally. Um, yeah. yeah. And And again, this goes to understanding the relationship between you and the technique and you and the goddess. Mm -hmm. Whereas it may be best if you're feeling disembodied or you're feeling you have a tendency towards, um, you know, just not being comfortable resting is you sit up against the wall. I love that. With your face towards the door and your legs closed and your eyes just at half mass. Yeah. And you just allow yourself to receive the practice in that way. You know, I know it seems like maybe a a side note, but I think that this point is super important and I'm glad we're giving it a little bit of time because, you know, the way you and I learned asana as well, it's like vata dosha, which is, you know, fear, anxiety, freeze, trauma, nervous system states. Vata Dosha hates going into Shavasana. You know, she hates going into child's pose and holding it. And I think 
there are way more people than we may realize that like find sitting still intolerable for, for a very real reason. And so I love that we're kind of saying like, you know, and I think of the work of like our friend Uma Dinsmore Tully, who, who her approach to yoga nidra is so like feminine. It's like, you're in yoga nidra all the time with her, you know, it's like this natural flow of, of prana that, that like is available actually when you're not necessarily laying down and putting your eye pillow on and, you know, that's exactly right. And, and Swami Veda Bharati talked about that as well, is that there, there are many uh, little yoga nidras during the day. If you mm. are aware of the transitions, there wow. is yoga nidra happening every moment of the day. And that's what yoga nidra at its deepest, and I won't say at its deepest, at the level that, that we, we start to go deeper, is that we're actually attuning ourselves to those transitions during the day. And I'm glad that we're talking about just the idea of um, these different positions and ways in which you can practice because there's a chapter in the book that basically gives you different ways in which to practice. Um, and I think that if you are practicing with someone, um, it's really good to know if you are affected by trauma that the person who you're working with is educated in some way about other options other than just lying down. On right. The, I think that's so pillow. important. Yeah. Like trauma has to be because trauma usually happens in relationship. <laughs> and I'm not talking about, you know, a war veteran, but like little, little trauma, it, it happens in our attachment system, primary caregivers, et cetera. So like it actually has to be rewired in relationship. And so this is beyond the scope of what Tracy and I are talking about with yoga nidra, but um, to really, but, but it comes up when you are a yoga nidra teacher, or a yoga teacher, Ayurvedic practitioner like myself, I see a lot of this and I just want to encourage everyone. Like it, it needs that primary bounce off relationship of another educated person who has a background in helping people rewire and dismantle those states. So it's, yoga nidra is not going to necessarily do it. <laughs> you know, we need to have support. Yeah. And, and it's one of the reasons why when we do our trainings um, and workshops, we always provide um, information for therapists. Yeah. We because do I'm not a therapist and, but there are many therapists and psychologists that are actually trained in yoga nidra Yes. And so it's a beautiful thing to be able to avail yourself yeah. to these resources of people who can continue to help you with the dismantling and the support. Right. Because as you're doing this, let's, let's be honest, stuff comes up, Tracy, and 100%. We, we need support. And it's like, we're all at this moment, figuring these things out and having, you know, a teacher, a helper, a therapist. I always say at Shakti school, this isn't therapy. It's therapeutic, but it's not therapy. Um, on that note, this therapeutic practice of yoga nidra, the first thing, obviously we're all going to get your book, but here's the other thing that I know my students and listeners are going to be asking. And I selfishly really, really want to know this. I want you leading me through yoga nidra. So do you have recordings? Like what's the story? I want Tracy Stanley's voice in my head when I go to the goddess couch of yoga nidra. I appreciate that. So yeah, actually the book comes with six free downloadable oh, practices. Of course. So Perfect. you can just go right to those practices right away. Um, and I'm also reading the audiobook. Um, so if you're interested in the audio book, um, but yeah, the, the book comes with six free practices that you can download. Um, the book comes out March 9th, so not too long to wait. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't wait to have you in my earbuds as I'm lounging about on the goddess couch. I don't want this podcast to end Tracy, but I know you're a busy gal. I am so grateful for your brave work in the world. And, um, we love having you here at the Shakti school. You're one of our favorite teachers mm -hmm. and yeah, thank you for your time. We'll definitely let everybody know about the radiant rest. 
Thank you so much, Katie. Love seeing you and spending time with you today. Thanks for having me. Put the pull